if Washington had not done that, done, you know, if he had not converted his army into an army of slave catchers, that would have raised a hue and cry from Virginia authorities. He's a Virginian himself and a slave owner. He has a vested interest in the continuation of that uh, labor system, for want of a better uh, descriptor. But, you know, he, he would have been persona non grata in his own state. An excerpt from today's guest was written an eye-opening article about George Washington in the Journal of the American Revolution. Author and military historian Dr. Greg Irwin is here, and I'll speak with him after this break. This is Point of the Spirit. Welcome back. I'm Robert Child. Today's guest is a professor of history at Temple University, a past president of the Society for Military History, a fellow in both the Company of Military Historians and the Foundation of the Defense of Democracies. He has appeared in numerous documentaries and assisted in the making of the Civil War epic, Glory. His current article in the Journal of the American Revolution is called Yorktown Tragedy, Washington Slave Roundup. An esteemed military historian, Dr. Greg Irwin, joins us now. Greg, welcome to the show. It's good to be here, Rob. Thanks for having me. You've appeared in several of my documentaries, and it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to always talk with you. Same here. This story was a, it was a great surprise to me. And before we get into the article, I wanted to ask your opinion, or your take on the vote in the New York uh, chamber to remove the statue of Thomas Jefferson. Well, you know, that's, that's a matter of, uh, of local control. Uh, and uh, New Yorkers, if they and the representatives uh, feel that way, they have every right to decide whose uh, images are going to be honored in their public buildings. I- I'm kind of saddened by it, though. I, uh, I h- hate to think that, that we've reached a, a point where if people uh, of the past have uh, committed certain uh, sins, uh, for want of a better word, that that blots out everything that they have done uh, and everything that they've contributed. I'm all for full disclosure. I don't believe in mythologizing the past. I'm all for full disclosure. I don't believe in sanitizing the past. Uh, We can't understand who we are if we don't understand where we came from. But at the same time, this idea that we can just blot out past injustices by uh, banishing uh, the memory of certain people. Uh, I, I think that's. Uh, I don't think that's. I don't think that's the mature response. So New Yorkers have the right to do what they want to do, but uh, what what do you learn uh, from that? It, it, it just sounds like uh, 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 the imposition of a kind of collective amnesia. I, I agree. Maybe they're going to be going after. You know, George Washington next. Well, it's possible. It's possible. It'd be a shame. Uh, but if perfection is the litmus test, no one's statue uh, will remain standing. Even today's uh, favorites, uh, like Dr. King, then, then there, there he goes. And right. we forget about all, all that he achieved. Right. Yeah, you need the balance. I agree. Getting back to the article, one of the facts that surprised me was that, um, you know, up to 30,000 blacks from Virginia in 1781 had joined up with the British and were serving with the British Army or following the British Army. Why so large a number? Well, that number uh, comes from Thomas Jefferson, a letter he wrote after the war, and, and there's a really good chance it was inflated. Uh, we don't have an exact number. Uh, we have a lot of anecdotal evidence and certain sl- enslavers saying they lost so many slaves, etc. We have depositions from about a dozen co- uh, counties of uh, planters who uh, filed for reparations uh, with the Virginia State Legislature, and they list the slaves that they they. Uh, claim were either uh, uh, taken by the enemy or that ran off to the enemy, list their values. But those records aren't complete. There are a number of people in those counties. Uh, we have no, no uh, filings from them. About a dozen counties that the British swept through, uh, there are no filings at all. Uh, they either got lost or destroyed. Mm-hmm. So 
you know, at minimum 6,000. That, that's the number that, that's held by some cautious historians. But I think there were more. Uh, there were enough to panic uh, the ruling class in Virginia, okay. or enough to panic uh, the people who were in charge, enough to really hurt them and to hurt the local economy. When the war moved to the South in 1778, when it shifted from the, the northeastern colonies, what was the reaction of the slaves on the plantations to seeing the British arrive? Uh, well, it was, uh, in many cases, exultation. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bannister Tarleton, uh, the notorious British cavalry commander, in his, uh, his memoirs, he said that uh, after the British took Charleston, South Carolina, then moved into the interior to pacify the rest of the state, uh, the very sight of the king's troops seemed to make slaves feel that they had permission uh, to quit uh, their masters or their owners or their enslavers and to quit the plantations and to go off with the king's troops. And, and many of them did. Many of them did. So they saw this as their opportunity uh, to get free of enslavement, to get free of bondage. And not all of them, uh, because there were risks involved. If you were apprehended, uh, masters were known to uh, sometimes be cruel in their punishments. One slave in Virginia who's a uh, uh, case uh, I, I uh, uh, uncovered on his first escape attempt uh, when he was recovered. His master had uh, his uh, initials, the master's initials, uh, branded high into the man's cheeks. And there are other punishments that we know about. But many, many saw this as their best opportunity uh, to become free, and, and they took advantage of it. And, you know, with the large number of slaves that did flee the plantations, they became, uh, after a while, impediment to the British movement, and Cornwallis disagreed or had issues with it. When Cornwallis uh, was given the mission after the fall of Charleston of moving into the South Carolina countryside, the roads that he was trying to use to move his troops, uh, to move his baggage, his artillery, his surplus ammunition got choked with all these, all these runaways. And of course, these people weren't under, under discipline. Uh, they, they took some food and, and some belongings uh, from uh, the places that they left. Um, but, you know, uh, that would only last them for a brief period of time. Uh, the British Army was, was now uh, responsible for taking care of them. But, you know, when you have this large number of refugees uh, jamming the roads and following behind you, uh, that cuts down on the mobility of, of your army. It's also something of a, of a threat to discipline and order. So Cornwallis at first was, you know, what, what are we going to do with all these people? They're, 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 they're a, a pain in my neck. Uh, and uh, the British uh, ended up in South Carolina um, uh, placing them on uh, abandoned plantations, plantations that had been abandoned by rebel owners. And they, and they told them, you can work here and raise your own food and, and, and put these places back in, into production. Later in Virginia, Cornwallis uh, had a system. Uh, he would allow uh, each one of his regiments and each one of his officers to have so many black servants. And these people had to carry identification papers. They had to have the unit to which they were attached uh, the number or, or, or insignia of that unit painted on the back of, of their jackets. Uh, and then the rest uh, were, were shipped down to Portsmouth, uh, where they were used to build entrenchments and also, again, to work uh, on the outlying farms and plantations. Uh, and, and he realized that uh, when Blacks uh, quit their masters, quit their owners, they were no longer supporting the rebel economy. Mm -hmm. um, also, uh, the idea that, that slaves would suddenly take their destinies into their own hands, it really frightened a lot of enslavers in the South because they, they lived with this fear that if the slaves were not kept under firm control, they would rise up and attack the master class, that you'd have this massive race war which would uh, result either in the extermination of, of whites or the extermination of blacks. And that would paralyze the militia. Instead of turning out to face the British, they'd say, no, we've got to stay home and keep an eye on, on the slaves. Uh, so it, it became something of a military asset 
for for the British. Uh, Cornwallis uh, himself uh, opposed arming blacks. He did not want a race war, uh, but he was happy to to use them uh, uh, as laborers. Uh, and uh, uh, they were uh, also assigned to some of the departments of his army, the commissary, which gathered food, did foraging, quartermaster, uh, uh, who uh, moved supplies and distributed supplies to the troops, and, and the ordnance, the artillery. They could be useful there, moving the guns, moving ammunition wagons, et cetera. There, there were a handful of blacks who were actually enlisted in some of the units under Cornwallis as as trumpeters, as as musicians, but they carried weapons. Mm. And at least one of them we know uh, fought in a battle at the Battle of Green Spring, where he captured a French officer serving with the Continentals and, and performed some other deeds of valor that his commanding officer uh, celebrated uh, in his memoir, John Graves Simcoe. And who was this that captured the French officer? He, he would uh, give his name when he reached England as Bernard Griffiths. Uh, on the roster of the Queen's Rangers, this was an, a loyalist unit. He was listed as Black Barney, and he was a trumpeter. He was a trumpeter, but uh, you know he he was a fighting man and, and respected by his peers. He was later uh, granted the equivalent of a, of a, of a veteran's pension uh, after the war. Uh, Simcoe uh, interested himself in this man's case and did the best he could to take care of him. In fact, he probably smuggled him out of Yorktown. Uh, after the surrender, the British uh, were allowed to use a, a dispatch boat called the Bonetta. And as a courtesy, uh, you know, it was to carry Cornwallis's dispatches. Hey, I've surrendered to Sir Henry Clinton at New York. But as part of the uh, surrender agreement, uh, the Continental authorities said, we will not search this ship. And so a lot of the, a lot of Continental deserters who had joined the loyalists who might have been executed, and a number of blacks, uh, including probably Black Barney, got stuffed on that, inside the Bonetta and then sent up to New York, uh, which saved their lives. I wanted to take a moment to thank our growing army of listener supporter members. You make it possible to continue our mission of bringing you the best military history authors, filmmakers, and movers and shakers. If you're not a member yet, it's easy to join, and it takes just seconds. Scroll down to the bottom of this episode's description and click the support link. You'll come to our anchor page. Click the support button. Complete the brief form. It's that easy. We're planning loyalty perks and giveaways to roll out over the coming months for our early supporters who sign on before the end of the year. So don't wait. Become a member today. And thank you for your support. It's rare that if I go to a public event that somebody doesn't come in and uh, comment uh, on either Gettysburg or Gods and Generals. Director Ron Maxwell on History Storytellers. You know, you, you never know how a film's going to be received when you make it, and you never know how it's going to be received uh, w with the passage of time. I think certainly in the case of, the, of Gettysburg, we started with an extraordinary novel, uh, Michael Shara's The Killer Angels. Great storytelling, great characters. And uh, then we had a great cast, uh, just a wonderful collection of actors, wonderful crew. And it was a magical time. I mean, we worked our butts off the summer of uh, 1992 at uh, Gettysburg when we filmed that. Uh, long hours. We had way too many setups that we could possibly have done per day. But we did it. We got the job done. And uh, we remain to this day a band of brothers and sisters, those of us who worked on that movie. Watch season one of History Storytellers on Amazon Prime Video. Now, speaking of Yorktown, the day after the surrender of the British at Yorktown, Washington issued an order freeing every American soldier under arrest. But five days later, he issued a different order. What was that order he issued? Washington issued an order to his main army, the troops we credit with guaranteeing American liberty by capturing Cornwallis at Yorktown. He ordered them to round up all the runaway slaves in the area, uh, both uh, uh, he called the Negroes, and then he used the Spanish word for mixed blood, uh, mulatto. But they, they were to all be gathered together, do not pay attention to anyone who claims he's free. Uh, and they were to be brought to two central locations, one on the south side of the York River, uh, where Yorktown was located, and one on the other side, the north side, where the British had a small post called Gloucester. 
Uh, they were to be uh, taken to a fortification on each side of the river and kept there until they could be reclaimed by their masters. What was the uh, result? I mean, how many slaves were recaptured and brought in? You know, I don't, I don't have an exact number there. Uh, I do, and some of these depositions um, have information uh, from uh, slave owners who, who talked about slaves being recovered, uh, when or where. Uh, they don't really specify. They talk about some slaves who came home on their own uh, once it was all over, or even in the middle of the campaign. Uh, the British had a certain amount of uh, discipline that they imposed on their runaways, and not everybody enjoyed that. Uh, but uh, uh, the French, it's interesting, um, uh, uh, you know, a good part of, of the of the army that, that that captured Cornwallis was was French under under the Comte de Rochambeau. Um, a number of the officers in that army uh, took some of these runaways as their servants, mm. which created an enormous diplomatic problem that, that yes. extended to the end of the war. The correspondence going back and forth. Uh, between Washington and Virginia authorities and uh, Continental Congress and, and, and Rochambeau is just, uh, in many ways, it's funny because the French were just kind of buying time until they left. Uh, but one officer in his journal said that, that we French picked up a lot of, of servants at a cheap price. I'm sure that was a, a touchy subject at the time. But there are, are uh, the uh, runaway slave notices that appeared in the Virginia Gazette throughout the war. Uh, and, continued after Yorktown and notice after notice talks about so-and-so was spotted at the town uh, after the surrender. Uh, and then they were last seen traveling North, traveling East, or they, you know, they were spotted in Fredericksburg and were trying to track this person down. They give the description. So there were a lot of, uh, of roving uh, freedom seekers. Uh, some probably headed to the great dismal swamp in North Carolina some did find their way up to New York, uh, but it's uh, uh, getting a full accounting of uh, what happened to each and every one of those individuals. That's eluded me so far. Reading through the article and some of the comments, the point was brought up that Washington was just following state law on um, issuing this order. Do you agree with that? Yeah. I mean, if Washington had not done that, done, you know, if he had not converted his army into an army of slave catchers, uh, then he would have... Uh, that would have raised a hue and cry from Virginia authorities. He's a Virginian himself and a slave owner. He has a vested interest in the continuation of that, uh, of that uh, labor system, for want of a better uh, descriptor. Um, but, you know, he, he would have been persona non grata in his home state. He's also working for the Continental Congress, which, uh, you know, is sensitive to the fact that uh, uh, most, in fact, all the states, when you go into the war, slavery is legal uh, for some of the more prosperous states, including Virginia. Uh, slavery is considered essential uh, to, uh, to the economy. And in those states with big slave populations, uh, the white uh, elite uh, believe that the slave population has to be kept under control. So I, I can't see him uh, doing anything else right. in the situation or any other Continental commander in his place. But the fact that he did it tells us something about the values uh, uh, of his side in the war, you know, and, and, and we, we need to note that yeah. uh, because those values uh, mire the United States in a situation that almost culminate in its self-destruction 80 years later. Right. And in your research, I know that he, and you mentioned it, he owned slaves. And I, I understand he, upon his death, he freed his slaves. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, he, he did. He did. He, he, you know, and, and, and then that, you can view that as, as a nice thing. You say, well, he waited until he didn't need them. Uh, but he did. And, and there were aspects of slavery, you know, that bothered him. Uh, he, uh, before the revolution, in fact, swore, uh, having seen the pain it caused, swore he would never separate a family again at the auction block. If he sold slaves, he would sell them as families. He wouldn't sell off a father or a mother or a child, uh, which, you know, um, it, it, it certainly bespeaks a certain sensitivity. 
His closest companion during the war, uh, William Lee, was a, a mixed blood slave uh, who uh, uh, was, served as his valet uh, uh, throughout the war, uh, served Washington faithfully. He's the only slave that Washington mentions in his will. And he not only frees Lee, but he also says he should have a, a $30 uh, per year pension and uh, that he should be permitted to live on the estate as long as he wanted to. After the war, Lee broke on different occasions, broke each leg or each knee and ended up crippled. Uh, he couldn't work as a valet anymore, but Washington kept him on as, a, as an overseer. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much overseeing he actually did, but he gave him that title and as a shoemaker. Also, uh, Lee, uh, in 1775, met a free black woman in Philadelphia, and they got together, and Lee considered her his wife, even though such unions were not recognized by Virginia law at the time. After the war, Washington tried to make arrangements to bring her to Mount Vernon. We don't know if he succeeded, uh, but so there's a side to the man uh, 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 you know, as a slave owner. I mean, he, he, he still kept slaves uh, when he was president of the United States and the government was in Philadelphia. It was a, a, a certain northern colonies or states began moving to either end slavery quickly or, or gradually. And Pennsylvania had passed a law that said that any outsider who brought a, a slave or slaves with him into Pennsylvania, after six months, those slaves would be free. Now, President Washington Living when, when the government was in Philadelphia, he's an outsider. He, his household is staffed by slaves that he brought up from Virginia. When that six-month deadline became imminent, he would take them out of Pennsylvania because if they were out of the state for as little as one day, the clock went back to zero. Oh. So he's holding on to slavery. And, and, and it was a seamstress who uh, uh, either belonged to Martha or she worked for Martha, Oni Judge who escaped, who ran away. And, and Washington worked very hard to try to secure her, her recapture. He was unsuccessful. So, you know, there's, there's a positive side uh, 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 in his life as, as a slave owner or as an enslaver, I guess, if we can call it that. I guess as a privileged white male, I, I, I fall into using that term. But on the other hand, he's still trapped in that system. Right, right. It, it was the era. And this incident of rounding up the slaves after the victory at Yorktown, how do you feel this place places in the broader context of the re revolution? What do you believe how, how it fits? It, it reminds us that the revolution won liberty for some Americans, but it perpetuated bondage for others. Uh, you know, there's just no other way uh, around it. Uh, you know, the, the, the founders uh, professed high ideals like politicians do today. Um, and, and some of what they said, a lot of what they said was inspiring. We still quote it. Uh, but uh, we have to look at their actions, too. <laughs> you know, uh, politicians say a lot of things for public consumption. Uh, but uh, what do they actually do? And I'm not trying to say they were hypocrites. Uh, again, uh, uh, they, they, they have to answer to constituents. And if they want to remain in power, they have to keep certain constituencies happy. And when this country uh, was founded, uh, even politicians who didn't like slavery realized, well, we're just going to have to learn to live with it or there's not going to be a union. Uh, uh, the, larger, the states with the larger slave interests will not join or will not stay in. So they were white and they made a decision that, that suited white interests. But if they hadn't made that decision, then there might not been a, have been a United States. And if they hadn't spouted that egalitarian rhetoric, which a lot of Americans took literally and would seize on that and would insist that the frontiers of freedom in this country be broadened, that white men who didn't have much or any property should be allowed to vote, uh, that uh, former slaves, uh, male slaves, uh, should get the franchise, that eventually women, adult women, should get the franchise, mm -hmm. and that if you're old enough to fight for your country, if you're you know, 18, maybe the, you should be able to vote too. Um, none of that would have happened 
Uh, and again, being a privileged white male, it's easy for me to take the long view, although my, my, dis- my ancestors weren't all privileged. privileged. Uh, I'm, I'm descended from immigrants, mm-hmm. uh, coal miners. Uh, but, you know, sometimes, well, most of the time, uh, when you're moving to the light, you don't do it at light speed. Uh, it, it takes uh, takes baby steps, uh, sometimes longer strides. But 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 the people who got us moving in the right direction, even if they weren't perfect themselves, I think they deserve some credit. I think they deserve some credit. The article is called "The Yorktown Tragedy: Washington Slave Roundup," and you can read it online at the Journal of the American Revolution. Well, I'll let you go, sir. I appreciate your time, as always. You too. You take care. Keep prospering. That's it for this episode. Thanks again for joining me. Next time, my guest will be filmmaker Ryland Soroff, and we'll be discussing his extraordinary documentary, 6th of June. Our hope with the film is that when we were making it, it was leading up to the 75th anniversary, and we realized, you know, it doesn't matter what happens with the film or where it was distributed or who got on board or awards that it, you know we might have received or places that the film was screened. It was really just about how can we impact these people who gave us so much. That's next time. And don't forget to be here for our very special Veterans Day episode. Believe me, you won't want to miss it. And as always, if you like what you hear, please share the show on social media and follow me on Twitter, at Rob Child. I'm Robert Child, and this has been Point of the Spirit. Music licensed from audioblocks.com. Point of the Spear is produced by RSC Media Group.